It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. Today we're going to compare and contrast more elements of the Hometic Epics to the Gospels. If you guys have not seen the first part of this video series about the Hometic Epics and the Gospels, I highly recommend you guys check out the first part. But uh, the first part of the whole entire series is like an hour long in comparison to this video. And so I'm hoping this video is much shorter in comparison to the last one. Before I start this comparison, I first want to state that this comparison is not necessarily my own personal original idea. The idea of comparing Hermetic epics to the Gospels comes directly from a New Testament scholar named Dennis McDonald. And I recommend you guys buy this book. It's only like $25 on Amazon right now and it has over 500 pages of material. And so I highly recommend you guys to purchase this book and also do your own research before you accept the ideas that I'm going to say in this video. When it comes down to the miracle claims of Jesus Christ, it's not surprising that they become more and more fantastical with every single book. Now the most grounded of the books happens to be the book of Mark. By the time you read the book of Matthew, the book of Luke, and the book of John, the claims become more and more fantastic as they begin to evolve about the particular character of Jesus Christ. Now one of the miracle claims that they attribute to Jesus Christ in the New Testament is the idea that Jesus Christ can feed over 5,000 different people. He fed over 5,000 different people with two fishes and five loaves of bread. Now what happened in the Odyssey for chapter 3 is that basically there was a humongous fest where over 500 people each get fed like their food. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes except we should go and buy meat for all this people. For they were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and brake, and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat, and were all filled. And there was taken up of fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. And now the sun, leaving the beauteous water surface, sprang up into the brazen heaven to give light to the immortals and to mortal men on the earth, the giver of grain. And they came to Pilus, the well-ordered citadel of Neleus. Here the townsfolk on the shore of the sea were offering sacrifice of black bulls to the dark-haired earth shaker. Nine companies there were, and five hundred men sat in each, and in each they held nine bulls ready for sacrifice. Now when they had tasted the inner parts and were burning the thigh pieces to the god, the others put straight into the shore, and hauled up and furled the sail of the shapely ship, and moored her, and themselves stepped forth. Another similarity between the two stories is that for the book of Luke, what they had was a great supper for everybody to come. And similarly, there's also a great supper that also occurs within the Odyssey. A certain man made a great supper, and bad many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have uh, bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. 
For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And they came to the hollow land of Lagadimon, with its many ravines, and drove to the palace of glorious Menelaus. Him they found giving a marriage feast to his many kinsfolk for his flawless son and daughter within his house. His daughter he was sending to the son of Achilles, breaker of the ranks of men. For in the land of Troy he first had promised and pledged that he would give her. And now the gods were bringing their marriage to pass. Her then he was sending forth with horses and chariots to go her way to the glorious city of the Myrmidons, over whom her lord was king. But for his son he was bringing to his home from Sparta the daughter of Alector, to wed the stalwart Megapenthes, who was his son well beloved, born of a slave woman. For to Helen the gods vouchsafed issue no more after she had at the first born a lovely child, Hermione, who had the beauty of golden Aphrodite. So they were feasting in the great high-roofed hall, the neighbors and kinsfolk of glorious Menelaus, and making merry. And among them a divine minstrel was singing to the lyre, and two tumblers whirled up and down through the midst of them, leading the dance. Then the two, the hero Telemachus and the glorious son of Nestor, halted at the gateway of the palace, they and their two horses, and the lord Eteoneus came forth and saw them, the eager squire of glorious Menelaus. Another aspect that is very consistent between the two stories is the notion of a faithful woman, because in both stories, they have really faithful women who happen to be old that never left their husbands. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And from her upper chamber, the daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, heard his wonderful song. And she went down the high stairway from her chamber, not alone, for two handmaids attended her. Now when the fair lady had come to the suitors, she stood by the doorpost of the well-built hall, holding before her face her shining veil, and a faithful handmaid stood on either side of her. Then, as the tears filled her eyes, she spoke to the divine minstrel, Phemius, many other things you know to charm mortals, deeds of men and gods which minstrels make famous. Sing them one of these as you sit here, and let them drink their wine in silence. But cease from this woeful song, which always harrows the heart in my breast, for upon me above all women has come a sorrow not to be forgotten. So dear a face do I always remember with longing, my husband's, whose fame is wide through Hellas and mid-Argus. Then wise Telemachus answered her, my mother, why do you begrudge the good minstrel to give pleasure in whatever way his heart is moved? It is not minstrels that are to blame, but Zeus, I suppose, is to blame, who gives two bread-eating men to each one as he will. With this man no one can be angry if he sings the evil doom of the Danaeans, for men praise that song the most that comes the newest to their ears. For yourself, let your heart and soul endure to listen. For not only Odysseus lost in Troy the day of his return, but many others likewise perished. Now go to your chamber, and busy yourself with your own tasks, the loom and the distaff, and bid your handmaids be about their tasks. But speech shall be men's care for all, but most of all for me, since mine is the authority in this house. She then, seized with wonder, went back to her chamber, 
for she laid to her heart the wise saying of her son. Up to her upper chamber she went with her handmaids, and then wept for Odysseus, her dear husband, until grey-eyed Athene cast sweet sleep upon her eyelids. So what do you guys think about these comparisons? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.